Hey folks, Ray from DCRamerica.com here. Today with me, I've got Shane Miller of GP Llama and Des of DesFit. Um, and we're getting something a little different. This is actually the Fit File podcast. You may remember a, a few weeks ago, uh, I talked about it in a quick little video. Um, in this case, we're all in the same place and we'll talk about why in a moment. So we figured we just record it in this in this here in the kitchen with uh, all sorts of weirdness going on. Um, no rain, no rainbows. That's Chickens. It. Look, it's not our house. It's just some random Airbnb kitchen. So, is what it is. <laughs> Hopefully you enjoy this. Uh, you can also subscribe to the FitFile podcast in all the linkage down below. With that, take it away. Alrighty, welcome to the sixth episode of the FitFile podcast with DC Rainmaker, GP Lama, and today's special guest, Des from DesFit. How you doing, Des? Pretty good. How are you guys? Good, good. We're coming to you live, well, almost live, from Sea Otter. We've just come from Sea Otter day three, our day two yep. of the bike festival slash trade show slash... Celebration of bikes. So that's why we're here in the one room together uh, recording the FitFile podcast. So guys, last time we were together was in the DCR open house back in December. It's good to have the band back together. Mm -hmm. Tell us, it's been a busy few days. How are things, right? It's been good. It's uh, It's been a kind of really busy week now I think about it, but and we'll talk about all that good stuff coming up. But yeah, in terms of the last few days here with, with you two fools, it's been, uh, it's been good times. We've been lots of riding and more riding and more riding and more riding. And Des, we were hanging out a few days prior to this in San Francisco. We got some rides in. Your TSS must be through the roof. Yeah, that's what I was saying. I think it's probably in the four thousands, five thousands at this point. But uh, yeah, I'm, um, I'm, I'm, I've got a good bit of riding in, but I have to take advantage. It's uh, snowing in Colorado right now. I was going to say the weather has been absolutely perfect down here. So every time I'm in California, it's been really, really nice weather. So I think I've been very lucky. Tomorrow, our final day here. Hopefully, the ride's going to be great. Looking forward to it. Okay, let's get stuck into the show. Today's topic list includes big changes from Garmin at the Connect IQ Summit, the DCR optical heart rate sensor shootout post, all you need to know about optical heart rate sensors, SRAM buys power tap. We also talk about Wahoo's new hardware announced on April 11th. Trainer Road introduced outdoor workouts in a two-part announcement series. We'll dive into that. And Aerofly, the cheap power meter launch slash relaunch on Kickstarter. We have a look at the details we know so far on this, and we discuss if Kickstarter is the right place to launch a cheap power meter. Okay, kicking off today, Ray, you were over in Kansas last week at the Connect IQ Summit. Whilst presenting, you were also there to find out what was new in the zoo and all the details and changes and things there. We will link in the show notes, but if you're also a subscriber to DC Rainmaker's YouTube channel, there's the full 45 minute presentation that you presented up on there. Yep, the whole thing. Excellent, so tell us what's new from Garmin. Yeah, so there's, so the Connect IQ Summit um, is developer focused in the same way that WWDC is developer focused for Apple or Build for Microsoft and so on. Uh, and so in Garmin's case, they have the Connect IQ platform, those are things on wearables and edge devices and whatnot, uh, but they also have a lot of partnerships that aren't necessarily directly connect IQ, at least in the most visible ways. For example, Spotify um, is a partner that's there. And it technically under the cover, Spotify is a connect IQ app, um, but there's a lot, it's a lot more complex than that. Um, but also companies like Training Peaks and Trainer Road and others that are all there. Um, and I mean, it's just, there's, I don't know, 200 plus, plus people there. It was a big thing. There's also just even enthusiasts that are there that have paid their way to go there. And I don't know exactly how much it is. It's a couple hundred bucks, but it's, probably like the best deal out there because it's a couple hundred bucks and you get with it uh, a Garmin device. And this year it was a Garmin Phoenix 5 Plus, which is like worth what, 700, but I don't know. Plus. Yeah. <clears throat> plus. That's interesting. Plus. So it's actually open to the, gen not the general public, mm -hmm. the enthusiasts who can pay their way to, to go there. Yeah. Okay, so it's not just business to business. It can be, well, enthusiast to. Yep, exactly. And so there was, there was definitely a few people like that that were there. And um, most of them at least have some sort of like developer background. Uh, they may not be actively developing apps, but they're at least there and in the Garmin or whatnot. So uh, that was cool to chat with all, all those folks. And uh, so I presented first on, I think I called it like the potential and failures of sports tech or something like that. Mm -hmm. I uh, they just I was able, I was given like an hour slot to present on whatever the heck I wanted to, and that's what I came up with. And so I talked about things that are working well in sports tech and things that are not working well in sports tech. Things that need some love and areas that I see like massive potential um, if things can be tweaked a little bit. And so uh, that was live streamed, and then also we've recorded it and put it on. It's a so it's on Facebook live stream. You can watch it on Facebook or you can watch it on YouTube as well. Uh, and so that that went over well. And then after that, it was mostly just listening to different presentations there. Uh, so there's presentations the entire time about different technologies. And some of the, the big ticket items that have popped up is number one, 
uh, something called a training plan API. Uh, so in the past, if you had the Training Peaks app on your device, uh, you had to go ahead and use that app to download workouts from Training Peaks. Since so you installed the app, you had to link it via Bluetooth Smart to your phone. You had to authenticate with the app. It was just it worked, but it was also fraught with error. This is for taking workouts outside. So if your coach prescribed you a workout to do, such as five by five TT intervals, you could have them on your head unit and follow the plan outside. Or even inside, anywhere. So anywhere that a structure workout be done, structure workout for any sport, um, but it was cumbersome. And I mean, Training Peaks talked about some stats where only about a third of the people that downloaded the app onto their device successfully got it linked into the Training Peaks account. Um, just because it's cumbersome and people don't understand it. So what they're doing um, to replace that Garmin is, is basically saying that, you know what, for that function that needs to grow up and mature into mm -hmm. a service. And so they now have an API just like they have the sync that you know automatically syncs your files from your workout, um, or from your completed workout over to Training Peaks and Strava and all the platforms out there. They have sort of the inverse now for structured workouts. Uh, so pretty cool stuff. Uh, that is live today and Training Peaks is rolling it out over the next uh, short little while, like a couple weeks or a short little while. Um, so expect to see that, but also expect to see other companies jump on that bandwagon as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's reasons for that. One is that it makes everyone's life a lot easier. So in the case of Training Peaks, they can stop supporting that app so they can mm -hmm. reduce the support costs. In the case of customers, it means they can broaden the number of devices that Garmin supports. So previously that was limited to certain Connect IQ versions, which meant that I don't believe like the Phoenix 3 was supported, but 3HR was. So that was kind of a bummer. Now you can go all the way back to like the Edge 500. So we're talking things that are 10 years old that work with this. As long as it supports structural workouts. And the battery life lasts more than 10 minutes. And the battery lasts more than 10 minutes. They're an old minutes. unit, they do. Hedge yeah, I was trying away. to figure out like if the Edge, are they 41 to 305, the little red mm. orange one from way back in the day would yep. still work. Because that does support structural workouts. So technically that should. So they're now, not even, I'm from a cycling background, so the focus there is also cycling at well, any sport. Any sport, yep. So running and cycling. Any, and, and even, uh, my understanding is swimming I think as well works, which is, is kind of cool. Um, so lots of different sports, as long as it supports structural workouts, support mm -hmm. technically behind the scenes as long as it supports a dot fit file structure workout mm -hmm. right you're good to go um, so that's number one that was a big ticket item mm -hmm. number two is Garmin released a new connect IQ app store app um, so they now have an iOS and Android app on the app store that you can go ahead and download that and then manage your connect IQ apps on your device okay so to get my head around how the app store works mm -hmm. They've kind of replicated what we have in our pockets. So at the moment we have Apple or Android, whichever ship you sail on. And then you can go to either the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store and pull down the apps for that device. Is this kind of what they're doing with Connect IQ? They're allowing you to manage things. You can go to the Connect IQ yep. app and manage the apps from one place to pull down. It's like a exactly. shop almost or a store. It's like a shop. Speaking of shop, monetization of apps, so we not, not this year. Not this year, not yet. So uh, I think that's I think that's probably inevitable. Um, I think, you know, Garmin was trying to is trying to whatever get to the point where the App Store platform is solidified first before trying to move into monetization. Mm -hmm. uh, it's because monetization is a much more complex beast. I think it's a must have beast because if I was a, a software developer and I'm looking at, okay, which platform do I develop for, Android, iOS, or Garmin? Well, these are the two I can monetize straight away mm -hmm. and there's big dollars if you hit the jackpot over here. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. So I think that's the, where they're heading. What's interesting is they'll be able to learn a lot of the mistakes made in the mobile world exactly. over to the head unit world mm -hmm. specifically. So. Interesting times. Yeah, so there's there's that piece. And it's funny because when I first heard about this uh, a long ass time ago, they I was not thrilled about it. I was like, ah, just another app that I've got to use, another thing to install. Mm -hmm. But once you open it up and use it for more than like six and a half seconds, you realize it's really good. Can confirm in our... Um a rental car on the way down after dropping, <laughs> yeah. after picking Ray up at the airport. Ray tells me about how easy it is. And I'm like, it's not going to be that easy. Connect IQ was always a bit of a pain to put the apps on. Yep. Uh, within a few minutes, I had a llama background of a photo that <laughs> yep. I took on my four on a 935. Mm -hmm. So I downloaded yep. the app, I found the watch face, I, I reconfigured everything. So just the management of that, it kind of worked. It's been lacking, so they've filled that void. Des, have you used uh, Connect IQ to try and ma manage apps? And well, uh, yeah. Um, and what's interesting is that I do have a lot of comments about, you know, how do I get this particular watch face or a customized watch face on um, you know your your watch and um, for those of us who have been using uh, Garmin Connect for a long long time I don't want to say it's second nature but you know you just have the apps activities you can actually just go in and then you actually do that and it was nice that it was all consolidated however I can see how it does get lost in a rather complex app so mm -hmm. um, so yeah peeling it out I think I have to kind of mirror what Ray said that um, 
initially my thoughts were, uh, I don't know if I really want a second app, but at the same time, I think that it can provide a lot more functionality down the road. It consolidated it, simplified it mm -hmm. a lot. And given mm -hmm. the, what I, when I loaded the app and it just had everything loaded, it looked like it was its own app store. Yeah. I was mm -hmm. familiar with the experience. So on the wireless side of things, uh, a couple of things. Number one is full Wi-Fi access. And so that means that apps can now leverage Wi-Fi to upload or download data back and forth. And so previously that was restricted to music apps, so things like Spotify, et cetera. Um, but it can be useful to download bigger chunks of data. For example, if you want to download a whole pile of routes from Strava, um, that it may be faster to do that over Wi-Fi. Right now it's kind of a bit slow on, on Bluetooth for some of that stuff. So that's number one. Number two is act, adding ability to pair non-standard Bluetooth smart things. So right now you could pair like heart straps and stuff, heart rate straps, but you couldn't necessarily pair uh, a fridge or a car or whatever you wanted to. Whereas now you, you can if you wanted to pair a fridge. But the idea being that you can pair anything you want um, to a ConnectIQ app or communicate to um, any Bluetooth device out there. And so Garmin actually quietly uh, demoed this at CES and they just didn't tell anyone. But at CES this year, they showed unlocking, I believe it was a Ford card, Ford car um, via just a watch. And that was actually done behind the scenes via ConnectIQ with the mm -hmm. Bluetooth smart app. Uh, and no one asked, no one's like, is that Ant Plus? Which they could technically have done to be Ant Plus, but do you really think a Ford car is gonna have Ant Plus in it? Mm -hmm. Probably not. Um, so that was already shown, and now this this has a lot of potential beyond just mm -hmm. sports stuff. Uh, and you start smart getting home. Yeah. smart home stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they talked about like water bottles and other electronics around all sorts of things that you start communicating. Specialized has a helmet, for example, that doesn't have Ant Plus in it. The Air Hub from Michael Freeberg um, yep. from uh, Terrain Dynamics, who introduce a, effectively a smart trainer for outdoors. It provides more resistance on the front wheel. And I've always said, I'd love to have an app for that where it just kicked in for five minutes and then kicked out or prescribed more wattage dynamically. So that could really integrate with that very, very well. Exactly, and there's just there's a lot of companies too that um, I think even the Angie and Specialized and AirHub and others that started off and they're like, oh, we need to have Bluetooth in this. And that made perfect sense. And then they f didn't realize that that entire ecosystem of, you know, 95% of cyclists with GPS devices are using Ant and mm. Ant Plus. And so they could have used ConnectIQ to do development on that, but they were too far down that road to add in that chipset. So this opens those doors back up again where they can go, oh yeah, we can just leverage this in and be good to go. And then last but not least, probably the thing I'm most excited about is the removal of the $5,000 API fee. Uh, so in the past, Garmin would charge companies uh, $5,000 and they had to be approved to use APIs. So that's syncing things like your workouts, from Garmin Connect over to Training Peaks and uh, Strava and all the platforms out there. There's, there's many, many platforms. Uh, but you had to get approval and it was really hard to get approval. And on top of that, you had to pay $5,000. And so that pretty much closed the door on most, uh, not so much hobbyists, but like smaller companies that just were like, well, I'm not really sure it's a workout. We see a lot of people use the Strava API to make their own personal projects. That has been locked down quite a bit, but yep. there's still a lot of extensibility there and people are adding their own. So will we see this more with Garmin? I, I think so, definitely. And in the case of Strava, they have like, I don't know, 15,000 registered developers there, which is mind boggling. Mm -hmm. um, and so Garmin's opening this up. It's going to take, uh, they said, probably one to two months for everything to start really being kind of cooking along correctly. Mm -hmm. um, their goal isn't necessarily every single hobbyist. So Strava, any hobbyist can apply for Strava API and it's mm -hmm. done. Uh, in Garmin's case, they have a couple restrictions around it. Uh, one, you need to have a privacy policy in place so that you know, you're, you're taking data from an account that's authorized. You need to be able to put a privacy policy in place around how you're storing that and stuff. So mm -hmm. not a big deal for any company really. Um, and then they ideally want that particular app to have, you know, probably around 100 users after one year. So like as a, as a threshold for what they're looking for, which I think is pretty reasonable. Mm -hmm. It's not to the level of Strava. I'd love to see them go to the level of Strava and just be like, click a button, get the API stuff and be done. But it's a heck of a lot better than where they were up until this point. Cool, for me that's a good idea. If there's more access to the data that they can use for better idea, better training plans, and we've said this in a while across multiple platforms about using that big glob of data that's out there now that we've all been submitting to for years and years and years in smarter way. So if it allows people to come along and do that, I'm all for it. Deal, I agree. Speaking of data and data collection, this week uh, DCR put out an optical heart rate sensor shootout post, which was all you need to know about optical heart rate sensors. Des, first of all, do you use an optical heart rate sensor or a chest strap? Uh, I use generally a chest strap as well as two arm straps when I'm testing devices. So, Bam. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So okay. yeah, I, I use a lot of the um, 
mentions basically. So I use a Polar H10 primarily, mm -hmm. and then um, a Scotia Rhythm Plus as well as a Wahoo Ticker Fit. I'm old band. school. I started with the old Polar, the coded straps, yep. yeah, and yeah. I've always, I'm just so used to just putting a heart rate strap on every single worker. Mm -hmm. That's all I do. Yeah. And the, I have a few optical ones, but never use it. Ray, tell us what was the post all about? Yeah, so it was a, it was a straight up shootout between the Wahoo Ticker Fit, um, mm -hmm. our man that I just mentioned, the uh, Scotch Rhythm 24, uh, which came out about a year or so ago. It, these all, none of these are really new, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and then the Wahoo OH1, or not the Wahoo, the Polar OH1 Plus. Um, when the Polar OH1 Plus is technically new, but it's the exact same strap that came out almost two years ago, except in the last uh, little while they announced AMP Plus support for it. So that sort of like broadened up. That was sort of like the impetus for this entire post of, hey, now we've got three legit competitors side by side. What is What are the differences between them? What are the nuances? Everything from like, stupid things like weight to how much battery life to um, like how does it work on your arm? Does it like flip over in, in some of them? Mm -hmm. Like I went through every possible thing you could ever want to know with these three straps as a shootout between them all. Uh, and you know, I like optical heart rate sensors, um, but I really like armband ones. So if people have only tried wrist-based uh, ones in the watch, understand that this area right here is really up in your upper arm, um, is really like the best spot for measuring optical heart rate. Cause it's just chunky. It's like plenty of it's flesh. plenty of flesh. Mm -hmm. It's just, yeah, it's a good, like good little, like little grub spot. Whereas the wrist is a horrible spot because it's so hard. Like, especially for people who are very, very fit. Um, they don't have much there. Uh, that's why some people that are really fit will actually flip the watch on the inside out mm -hmm. and put their sensor portion on the underside of the wrist instead. Mm -hmm. It's generally, it's a little bit better accuracy. Um, but the wrist bone is there. A lot of people just wear it wrong. I think I have that tr trouble inside. Indoors, I get nice and cold on the indoor trainer. My arms aren't moving. And yeah, the readings aren't that great from my yep. watch. But an armband one does work. It, they work really well. So I just did a quick complete shoot out of that. It's, uh, I've been surprised at how many people were interested in it. Cool. I think there's like 100 plus comments in the first couple of days. Like mm -hmm. it's... It's, uh, it's, it's good stuff. All you need to know about yep. optical heart rate straps, good stuff. This week we also saw some really interesting news, another acquisition in the sports tech space, specifically cycling, SRAM buys PowerTap. Questions I have, is it a patent buy or do they have their eye on a few of those products to take it and enhance it? Now, we didn't see a lot move in regards to the P2 pedals. They're effectively mm -hmm. the P1s yep. that had a bit of a diet. The G4 hub we haven't seen yet. Ray, your thoughts on this buyer? Yeah, so it's really interesting. So if you look at the, uh, there's definitely a, a patent aspect of it, but not as much as people might think because the patent for the hub actually expired the exact same day the announcement was made. Ooh, that's um, so, and that wasn't on purpose, knowing that this was been coming for a long time. This was just like a happened to be coincidental sort of thing. Like they've been planned for a while and just announcement, even going back and forth between yesterday and the day before. So the fact that it happened the exact same day, just dumb luck. Um, but so yeah, the patent buy could be a portion for some of the other things like around pedals, for example, mm -hmm. um, because it's really hard from what I hear from other people in the industry to make a pedal based power meter that doesn't run a, a foul of Garmin, mm -hmm. Favero's or power type pedals. Like that's really tough or some of the looks uh, pedal patents as well. Uh, so that's tricky. Um, but I think like, honestly, uh, I talked with uh, Jim, the CEO of, of Quark about this a little bit. And he said that, you know, for them, they really do see a lot of value in the G4 and in the pedals mm -hmm. as well. Um, I, and they plan to continue both those products. Uh, so in the, the hub side, they absolutely plan to continue that. Uh, certainly you mentioned the G4 that PowerTap had teased last year at Eurobike. Mm -hmm. uh, basically what happened is PowerTap got into the fall time frame. They started talking about acquisitions of the companies and they put that whole thing on ice and they pretty much said, hey, we're gonna get back to this. Um, so there's been no development since last fall, but they got quite a ways far uh, through that whole process. So that'll come back again. Uh, Quark will pick that up, that development up um, and move forward. And then on the, the power tap pedal side, Quark has also said they will absolutely be looking at that, probably re-engineering it. My guess would be going to rechargeable um, mm -hmm. because that seems to be the general trend, probably shrinking that down quite a bit. Um, but I'm, I'm excited for consumers. I feel like in a lot of ways, the power tap product line was starting to like fade a bit um, and I don't think they necessarily had the resources there to to kick that into gear. So talking about consumers, how is that going to impact consumers from a support standpoint for power tap levels? It's good. So um, I was concerned as well, but in this case, what they're doing is Quark is taking over everything. Um, so in fact, starting next week, uh, Quark customer support, support folks will go into Madison and they're going to start um, turning themselves up on it. And then by May, Quark will be handling all customer support uh, for PowerTap. And so that'll be a complete changeover. And then starting over the course of the summer and probably in the fall, 
uh, they'll do all manufacturing, the move from Madison to Spearfish in uh, South Dakota there. So there's actually no employees moving from PowerTap um, to Cork. It's just purely a product slash passion slash whatever. Intellectual property. Yep, yep exactly. Uh, and then Cyclops did note that uh, no employees will lose their jobs as part of this either. Um, they're going to take all those power tap resources and double back into Cyclops uh, from an indoor training standpoint. Interesting. Des, you're more of a mountain biker than a road biker. Are you interested in something like the G4 for a mountain bike? Absolutely, just because it would actually be a protected unit. Uh -huh. So um, I would love to have pedals just because they would be easy to transfer from bike to bike, mm -hmm. um, but obviously the risk of damage is gonna be very, very high with pedals, so I just don't necessarily foresee that happening. So yeah, from a hub standpoint, that would be ideal. Um, we but... see a lot of crankbikes coming out for mountain bikes. Mm -hmm. Your cranks get mushed around a bit, banged about? They absolutely do, but generally the, you know, the actual sensor is not even close to where you would actually impact, which is gonna be the end of the crank arm, so. Okay, but it could uh, throw calibration out, I guess, during mid-ride. Absolutely, yeah. yeah, and I do like to hit things with my pedals every so often, so. <laughs> um, so yeah, absolutely. In terms of um, hub base, that would be mm -hmm. fantastic. Um, I think they're pretty much getting to a standard now with mountain bikes with um, with boost um, uh, 140 through 142 through axle. So yep. I think at this point there could be some potential. Interesting. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, in, in regards to the patents and the pedals, we know the pedals are super accurate. Might have been reliable for a while. The P2 is the same mm -hmm. thing, but the same pedals. Yep. So if they can use that same patent or the same techno measuring technology for a newer design pedal, bring it on. Happy days. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, now this is an interesting one. A few days ago, e Wahoo <laughs> emailed out their newsletter list with a save the date, something new is coming April 11th. Turns out people expected a whole lot more, but technically they didn't do anything wrong and technically they did release something new on April 11th, but probably a little bit too much hype on this. Um, I'd like to see this one just fall out of their pocket at Sea Otter because all we had were new colors of the bolt. We expected something new. With an email like that, that sort of builds expectation yeah. quite a bit. Uh, Ray, your take on an announcement like that? Given we just had the Trek Bontrager, we're gonna revolutionize cycling in 30 years and we release a new helmet, which is cool, not debating the helmet, but it wasn't a revolution in cycling. I think they miss they misread the room, if you will. Um, I think they, like there's nothing wrong with the new colors. The new colors are great. I totally get a lot of people actually like those colors uh, and they are, like if I had a pink bike or a blue bike, then I would probably consider that. I'll put my hand, I've got the pink one. I said, I, I, I don't know, the, every, <laughs> it's a fashion show. What can I say? I wanted the pink, but I've got a pink bolt, so. Yeah. That's fair. Like, and I know there's nothing wrong with that. I know that you know when Oahu did their their uh, red and yellow special edition colors, those sold extremely well for the company. They so did, yeah. um, there's nothing wrong with that at all. I think just the way this was phrased and knowing how much stuff has been circulating around, um, you know, Wahoo like leak rumor type stuff in mm -hmm. the last little while, and the fact that it's been you know a while since we've had uh, new Wahoo head units, I think. This, I think, this misread the room. And it, I think it we fed the beast that wants to know all about the inside info, that wants to yeah. think they you know were ahead of the curve, and then it came out when the, there was two parties to this: the tech nerds, yep. the people who wanted the zero day information, like us. We were like, oh, oh. But then there was the Instagram crowd who went, give me the pink. They will yeah. sell out in pink. There's no doubt these will sell yeah. out on mm -hmm. them. And we can see that if we look at those posts. Like you yeah. see, if you look at the Twitter post, it's savage. Like it's. I can't remember the last time Wahoo <laughs> tweeted anything that had that much hate um, <laughs> replied. There was no positivity on that Twitter post coming back but the, any comments. But the Instagram? Instagram? It looked pretty good. Because yeah, you can see the pink. Exactly. It looked, Daisies looked, and rainbows and mm, yeah, no rain, rain, rainbow sort exactly. of thing. Like it was great. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I think I think they just might have missed Rather Room a little bit. Um, but it's fine, it happens. I, there's worse. Worst mistakes a, a company could make, um, like ESD or something like that. So it's fine. Yeah. Anyway, technically it was new. Technically they did release it on that date. They yep. didn't. Uh, they didn't wait. So I, I think they should have gone with pink and green though. Oh yeah. <laughs> Considering those are my channel colors. But Brand colors. Oh, that's, uh, I'm just a little bit biased right. on that one. See, Ray's yeah. got the red one for the bike. Exactly. Well, the blue ones now. I've got a, everything I have is blue. Yeah. The pink just grabbed me. It just stood yeah. out as being just. No, I, yeah. I think the new colors are great, just um, a bit underwhelming for mm. the hype. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Mm. Speaking of announcements, and this is a two part announcement from Trainer Road. This week announcing their indoor workout. Well, Trainer Road are known for prescribing indoor workouts. You can now take those outdoors. A number of their Trainer Road workouts have now an outdoor component, which that if it's a nice sunny day and the Northern Hemisphere is going into summer, you can take that outdoors and get your workout done. It will lead you to pretty much the same kind of workout, not what for what. 
But at the end of the day, you'll get the same stimulus and the same TSS, and at the end of the day, same fitness. So pretty good stuff. The second part of that though, was linked to the Garmin API change. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So the second part of there, when they first announced their the outdoor workouts piece, uh, which by the way, if, if you are on trainer, trainer Road, you can go onto the forums, and then from there you can find out how to enable on your account. Uh, yes. Um, so you can, you can do that. Uh, but the second part hasn't been enabled for anyone yet. Um, but essentially it will allow them to go ahead and use that training plan API that we talked about earlier on Garmin side uh, to push those workouts straight from Trainer Road onto your Garmin head unit. Uh, and it sounds like that's coming like super quick. Uh, they had earlier access to that, that API and that platform. So mm -hmm. I expect that to be here uh, really, really soon. I know they're super excited about it and I think I am too. I think what they're doing there is, is really interesting. The forum community re received this really, really well. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason being is it's, it is so core to their mission of making riders faster cyclists. Mm -hmm. that's, that's their core mission. And that is absolutely it. We ride, we don't ride indoors to ride indoors. Mm -hmm. We ride indoors yeah. to be fitter cyclists and allowing us to use, right, if it's, I mean, again, if it's a nice sunny day like it's been out here, if we can take our training outside and also be rewarded for out there by ticking that box, mm -hmm. yep. bring it on. It's a brilliant play. Trainer Road, they're not the biggest in the indoor training space, but they're punching on and punching yep. on in the right directions. Not trying to replicate, they're doing their own thing and doing it well. I think this is a brilliant move. No, I agree. I think it's cool stuff. And should note as well that there are some tweaks to the way the workouts are enumerated as well. So uh, they, they simplify some of the workouts. They've got mm -hmm. a subset of workouts that they've, they're focused on that um, are more easily done outdoors in the sense of they're not giving you like 98 steps to go through. Mm -hmm. um, they're a little, a little more simplified that they're trying to do to achieve the same impact, uh, but make them doable in an outdoor environment with and things like that. And one thing they did note on the release notes is that some workouts are, they're harder to do outdoors because there's a lot of coasting, you're not gonna get as yep. high TSS. Mm -hmm. So they have extended a few of the intervals right. or a few of the sessions. Because again, indoors, there's no resting. There really is no let up. So indoors, you'll be a little shorter. Outdoors, they may be a little longer, but hey, we always run a little longer outdoors. So mm -hmm. again, yeah. as I said, I think it's brilliant. Can't wait to see this uh, get uh, rolled out with the new API. Speaking of rollouts and the hardware this time, and this is an interesting one, Kickstarter and cheap power meters. Does it send a shiver down all our spines? <laughs> this week, Aerofly, a cheap power meter, launched a, or relaunched a Kickstarter for their valve cap based power meter. Yes, you heard right, a valve cap based power meter. This was released or it was around back in 2016, 17, and it estimated your power based on a number of factors. I won't go into the full details now, um, links on their websites, etc. Look, this week we saw a relaunch. It kind of confused the industry. What are we looking at here? I'm, or what's, I'm looking for new things to buy. I want to consume these new things. If there's a new Kickstarter that I believe in, I'll put my money down. This one, alarm bells are going off. We see this promoted across Facebook with a number of spammy slash generic, you know, new tech startups or Kickstarter fun or this, and the, the title is um, New Cycling Technology You Must Have. All cyclists must have really spammy type things. But the one alarm that was set off in the back of my head was that they only required $6,000 to be funded, $6,000 US. Have you ever seen a Kickstarter? I, there's alarm bells no. going off here. It's all, I've been doing my research. For Not me, for hardware, it, it's, no. it's a keep clear. If the product is good, it will be released. It will work. The data will speak for itself. Ray, you've had a bit of history with Aerofly? I've or you've had, had a bit of, of history with Aerofly. Yeah, they, they are displeased with me. Um, so I, I, they had sent over some units a couple of years ago, the first ones. I tried them out mm -hmm. initially and um, I was like, eh, not so much. And mm -hmm. granted, things have certainly progressed since then, though I don't think a, a ton really. Um, and they were, they sent me like the longest email on earth, um, like a big long letter, like mm -hmm. just really upset about um, some of the, the comments I had made um, that uh, I felt were more than fair, in fact, way too fair um, mm -hmm. in some of this case. And so um, I, uh, the more I dug into this whole thing, the more I realized that there was so much that's not right. And like they had at the time on the website, they had coaches they claimed were Olympians, and they had athletes they claimed were Olympians, and on like the triathlete or the um, the Taiwan Olympic team and this kind of stuff for a triathlon for a certain year, and I'm like, those things just fundamentally don't exist. And mm -hmm. I I did a lot of follow up of different things, and the more I dug into this company, everything was fake. Everything that they had promoted on their website was fake um, or misconstrued or otherwise. So I just kind of dropped it. I'm like, you know what? I'm not. I don't really. I know the way this is going to go, and it's just not my cup of tea. The new developments they're stating here on the Kickstarter site is they now have a, a link. So you no longer have to run the app. The uh, aero sensor on your valve stem links to a piece of hardware which links your cadence sensor as well, which you have to enter your weight in. And there's a lot of 
ducts you have to line up. You actually have to enter your rider weight or system weight for it to be accurate. So let's just say I'm riding with two full bottles. What's the story there? What happens when I need to inflate my front wheel? That's mm -hmm. gonna have to uninstall my power meter and reinstall it. Is there a calibration process? Having said that, 94 backers are believing in this product at the moment and they are a, sitting at $18,000 funding. So they're more than 100% funded. All the best to the backers. We'll keep an eye on this one, but I'm not putting any money down at all. Uh, Buy how, much, how much was it uh, per uh, unit? How much did they say? Per unit? Let me just scroll down yeah. through here. The pledge of 169 US for the super early bird, 179 uh. for the early bird. So we're looking at around sub $200 power meters. And yeah. I, don't, I think history tells us it's impossible to do it. And impossible just, to deliver a reliable, accurate and power meter that doesn't make people swear. I mean, it's definitely the holy grail is, you know, coming out with a cheap yeah. power meter that works. But... At you know, at the same time, you know, Ray mentioned that, you know, $6,000 is hard for hardware, but honestly, $6,000 is hard for software. It, I yeah. mean, that doesn't pay a competent developer for one month. Salary. This is purely marketing at this point. This is just so. the typical market Kickstarter, like, mm -hmm. hey, let's start a Kickstarter because we think it'll attract attention mm -hmm. and... It has. We're talking about it. So, it has. but it's also where this is a warning about it. I've put a few tweets out yeah. as a warning. If you want to spend 160 bucks, I would recommend buying three power cows for that price. Like literally, I think you'll get better accurate data out of a power cal heart rate strap that transmits power. It's not like super good on intervals, like short intervals, but for most people, that's gonna give you a rough estimate for longer rides, longer durations than than this is. It's just an estimate and I I don't see this. I mean, I could be wrong. So this is just my opinion that it it's, could be wrong. The data but... will speak for itself. And any, I mean, it's the same with any review we all do. If, if yeah. we, if the data is incorrect, the community uh, this, uh, are onto it. The communication yeah. lines through Twitter, people know. So the data will speak for itself. If it comes out, is more accurate and it works and is what it says, yeah. hey, Hands yeah. down, awesome, that's great. But I think you'll get more accurate power meters out of, or power data, putting that money into a poker machine in Vegas, yeah. I think. I mean, even for hundred for sub $200, there is also like PowerTap products. They have PowerTap hubs now for 150 bucks on mm -hmm. their site. Like that is the one of the industry standards in terms of power accuracy out there now. Mm -hmm. You can get that PowerTap hub, lace it into wheel and you're good to go. You can get- Additional cost of putting it into a- Additional cost, yes. yep. Yeah. You can get a PowerTap C1 though on clearance in that general, a little bit higher than that, like in the low 200s a lot of times. Like. Mm -hmm. The thing with the Aerofly is that it's been around a couple of years. This isn't new. Um, and at no point in those last few years has a reader ever sent me a pile of data and said, hey, DCR, maybe you got it wrong a couple of years ago. Here's data showing that it's really good. Mm -hmm. Never has happened. Mm -hmm. Like that's that to me is a good indication that... Mm. History is a good predictor of the future. Yeah. Well, we want that to change, but... Well, I think that's the issue with power meters as well, is that the audience that wants power meters wants power meters to get very accurate data. Yep. And at this point you have to pay to play. And I would say to some people would say, ah, it's a race to the bottom. And I, I gave a presentation in Barcelona about this, the business school. And I don't, I think the race to the bottom terminology is flawed um, because in this case, like the, the cost of goods for the pod on the side of these power meters is between five and $15 for most of these mm -hmm. companies. Like that's it. So um, it's not a race to the bottom. It's a case of um, making the business sustainable at certain price points. And mm -hmm. these price points will absolutely go down. Anyone who thinks they aren't gonna go down is kidding themselves. Um, so yes, a $150, a $50 power meter is absolutely achievable in the next few years if the businesses behind those um, still make sense. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and those are accurate power meters, by the way. I'm not talking like, I'm just talking those companies taking those exact same products and the price just keeps on going down below. Well, we've already seen that in the last six months. So. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yep. SVM are dropping the price. Yep. Uh, Garmin Vector. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Everyone's everyone's dropping prices, and mm -hmm. you know, if someday IQ uh, Squared can can deliver that product uh, at that price point at the 150 or whatever it is, like if they can deliver an accurate product, then you'll see another huge shift, just like we saw when Stages first came in the market years ago. Change the game. Yep. So it, it takes someone to change the game. I think like we saw Watt Team get close to that. Um, they couldn't quite execute on that. In Perfect terms of shipping. example of why being too yeah. cheap doesn't work. It's the support of that. It's the overheads of that. You're mm -hmm. not just paying for the hardware when you purchase something. You are per you are paying for the ongoing support, the ongoing development, the firmware updates that you typically get for free from there on. Um, there's a lot of cost behind mm -hmm. it, and those costs when you start getting under that level, you need to scale massively. And to scale massively, you need something that's awesome and works straight away mm -hmm. that people just hype up and talk about. It's and a tough one, especially support. I think it's fair to say that. All of the major players in the industry today um, that are making accurate power meters have great support teams. Mm -hmm. Like 
every single one of these companies has great support behind them. I almost never hear of issues with uh, companies in the power industry that are mainstream on support. It's they take care of the customers and that's that's a differentiator and that's why you're paying what you're paying. Absolutely. And speaking of IQ Squared, yet another update this week with not much more of an update this week. So still, they're, they're saying things like, uh, we've found the issue, things are being resolved, we'll come out soon. But again, the data's the data. Let's see the data. Let's uh, get those things on bikes and uh, see where they take things. Yeah, I feel like at this point, they need to stop. I don't want to say stop updating because that sounds bad, but they need to either just... People are getting angry either way. Yeah, People like, are saying you haven't updated for a week. Now you update. We don't like this. They can't win either if, way. They're trying if they're going to gonna update, they should be providing some detail to update. If the, if the whole point is we found the issue, what was the issue then? Like be detailed on it, which is what some Kickstarters do. Like the, I've seen when you're talking tech hardware, the ones that go out and say, you know what? We've had issues. We're just going to we're going to dig deep on how issues, how deep these are and just talk about them. Like mm -hmm. I saw that with uh, y -Roll Cam back a few years ago, um, published updates that were incredibly tech nerdy detail. But that silences the critics. Like that immediately mm -hmm. goes, oh, here's the detail. Here's down to the chipset level what's going wrong. Here's where we effed up. It's going to fix it. And mm -hmm. that almost always silences the critics versus the nebulous stuff they're doing right now. Mm -hmm. Everyone's like, well, who knows? Maybe you've got a much bigger problem you're letting on. Mm, interesting stuff. Well, we'll keep an eye on this and expect another update next week on that one. All right, guys, almost time to wrap this one up. We have the final day of Sea Otter tomorrow. We're out for another yep. ride. We have some specialized Rubase. Rubase. Yep. And uh, yeah, we'll be rolling around on those. Mm -hmm. We have some uh, this suspension on the top. I didn't even know yeah. that had that. But <laughs> yeah. we'll be checking out the new bikes. And this is what it's all about at Sea Otter. Like looking at new tech, looking at where bikes are going and into the future. All good. All right, guys, that's a wrap for today's episode of the Fit File podcast. Be sure to keep an eye on the three of our YouTube channels, Twitter feeds, Facebook updates, and Instagram posts, where there's always something interesting happening in the DCR cave, the Llama Lab, and Des, what do we call yours? I have been struggling with the name forever. So if you have any suggestions, please. Don't, <laughs> don't look at us for names. It took us yeah. five episodes to get I, a podcast. I, I was going to throw some shade, but I, I can't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody has any ideas on what Des could call his cave or lab, let us know uh, on Twitter or contact us on Twitter. There you go. All good to go. All right, guys. Thanks for coming along. Good thank to see you. Thank you for having me on. Let's yeah. go ride bikes.